Father, through Jesus, his son. Amen. Word of God for us to consider is the first lesson for today, taken from Deuteronomy chapter 5. There, Moses shared with us the third commandment that God had given to his people. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. This is the word of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, who lived perfectly for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. If you are a Christian parent, you have probably, at one time or another, heard this question from your children. Do I have to go to church today? I remember when I was four or five years old asking my parents that question a number of times, and my dad was the pastor, and the church was only about 30 feet from our house. But as you know, Sunday mornings are cartoon mornings. And Rocky and Bullwinkle and Sherman and Peabody always had some very interesting escapades they were involved in. And caught in the middle of them, we'd look up and do we have to go to church today? Sadly, it's not only little children that ask that question. I've heard young children, teenagers, and even adults asking, do I have to go to church? Realistically, the answer to that question is no, you don't have to go to church. I'm glad that none of you got up and decided to go home because there's, there's really more to that answer than just no, you don't have to go to church. Going to church is in line with the third commandment where God told us to remember or observe the Sabbath day. Just going into a building with other people and listening to some words and singing some songs doesn't always qualify as going to church. And just going through those motions isn't earning you any grace in God's eyes that will help you work your way into heaven. There's much more to going to church than just showing up and going through the motions. That's what our text reminds us of today. Moses was relaying a message from God to the children of Israel who had just been delivered from their captivity in Egypt. And one of the Ten Commandments that summarized God's moral law for his people told them to observe the Sabbath day, remember the Sabbath day. So today we want to take a closer look at that command from God and to understand that remembering the Sabbath day is something God wants us to do, not for his benefit, but for our benefit. We want to remember the rest that it gives to us, and we want to remember the strength that it brings to us. The children of Israel had been in Egypt for about 400 years, the latter part of that 400-year period in slavery. And God had now set them free from their captivity in Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea miraculously, and they camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. God called Moses to the top of Mount Sinai, where for 40 days he gave them commands, civil, ceremonial, and moral commands for the children of Israel as they were going to go back to their homeland. The moral law has been summarized in Ten Commandments, the third of which is observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. God then explains in our text through Moses just what that means when he says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. See, God understands that we can't just spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sitting in a building with others singing songs and listening to Bible readings. He knows that we have earthly responsibilities, and that those responsibilities are a way we can also worship him. And so he said, for six days you can tend to your earthly needs, you can work at your jobs, you can raise your children, you can feed your families, you can provide clothing and shoes and, and house and home. But the seventh day is to be a Sabbath day. Sabbath means rest. It goes back to God creating the world. He created the world in the, on six days. And on the seventh day, he rested, which didn't mean he was tired and he took a nap, but it means that he stopped doing what he had been doing. So 
God was through Moses telling the children of Israel that for six days they could tend to their earthly needs, but then they were to stop doing that, and they were to rest. And he relates that to their current situation when he said, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Telling them to remember that they were slaves really wasn't something they, they needed to be told to do. It was a recent experience in their life, and it was a very difficult experience in their life. As the children of Israel lived in Egypt for their four, those 400 years, they began to multiply and to grow as a people, and they became so numerous and so large that the Pharaoh of Egypt began to worry that this large group of people might join together and might rebel against them and even take their things and kill them. And so he made them into slaves. And yet, through God's blessings, they continued to multiply and to be blessed. And so the Egyptian leaders tried to make it difficult on the Israelites. They commanded that any male babies that were born needed to be thrown into the Nile River and drowned to keep the population down. And those that were living were now put into a slavery that was made even more difficult because they were to build cities and towns and pyramids for the Egyptians, but now they wouldn't be supplied with any of the materials. They had to make the bricks out of clay and out of the stubble that they found in the grain fields in the heat of the day, and that would sap their energy so much that they wouldn't even think about rebelling against the Egyptians. And it was under those circumstances that the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard their cries, and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he delivered them from the Egyptians. He sent ten plagues to the Egyptians, and after the first nine, the Pharaoh said, I'll let the people go, but then he relented when the plague went away. But then God sent an angel of death to take the life of the firstborn child and animal in the homes that didn't obey him and put the blood over their doorposts. And so all the Egyptian families suffered those losses, and finally they wanted the Israelites gone. And so they let them go. And then they looked around and realized all their labor was gone, all their laborers were gone, and they sent the army to chase them, pin them up against the shores of the Red Sea. And the people looked back and said, why has God brought us here to die? At least we were alive and had a place to sleep and food to eat in Egypt. And that's when God told Moses to stretch out his hand over the Red Sea. The waters parted and the Israelites all went through safely and the Egyptian army started to follow and God brought the walls of water down on them and saved his people. He then called Moses to the top of Mount Sinai and he said, here are some rules to govern the lives of your people as a nation. Here are some ceremonial laws to govern the way that they worship me. And here are some moral laws for how they are to live as my children here on earth. Those being summarized in what we call the Ten Commandments today. And the third commandment was to observe a Sabbath day. The children of Israel finally had rest now. Rest from the oppression of the Egyptians. Rest from their slavery. Rest in the hands of God. And he said every week on the last day of the week now I want you to have a rest day to remind you of that rest which I've given you but more importantly to remind you of the spiritual eternal rest that I am giving you through the Savior I'm going to send and as the children of Israel took that time to rest they recognized that it was God giving them that rest and as they recognized that great blessing from God, they would worship and praise him and thank him for what he had done. Well, all those laws in the Old Testament were meant for Old Testament Israel. Colossians says that, that we are not to be held to the Old Testament laws anymore. But in the New Testament, God has repeated the moral laws. He has told us that the ceremonial laws, all those laws about how to worship and, and when to worship and where to worship, those were for Old Testament Israel to keep them focused on his promises. But now that Jesus has come, worship me as you please. The civil laws, that was for Israel, talking about if you, your goat did something wrong or your donkey or your, your ox gored somebody, th those were for Israel. 
But the moral laws summarized by the Ten Commandments have all been repeated in the New Testament, meaning that they're applicable to us as well. And so God tells us to observe or remember the Sabbath day, not the freedom that we have from the Egyptians or any other nation that has enslaved us, but more and most importantly, the slavery of sin that enslaved us from the time we were born. We are told that sinful parents give birth to sinful children. We heard that last week in Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Flesh gives birth to flesh. And people born sinful tend to continue to sin. Jesus said, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, theft, false witness, and the list goes on and on. Those, those sins we commit in our lives because we're sinful people. And if you are covered in sin and you know God's righteous demand given through his prophets that you must be perfect, how can you rest? How can you rest knowing that you're covered in the guilt of sin, the sin that can indict you in God's courtroom and send you to hell forever? Well, some people try to ignore that and don't, just don't talk about it and then I don't feel so bad. Some people try to justify their sin and excuse it and explain it. it makes them feel a little better then. Some people try to change the laws and water them down a little bit so that they don't look so bad. Maybe God grades on a curve on the last day. But finally, when we look into God's law, we hear Paul shouting at us that the wages of sin is death. And Adam and Eve didn't commit some big heinous sin for which they were condemned to hell. They ate a piece of fruit when they were told not to. So the little sins that we commit those are held against us and could send us to hell eternally. How can you go to bed at night thinking about all of those sins and your responsibility for them and wondering if you're going to wake up in the morning and have another opportunity to make God accept your works of righteousness for him? Observe a day of rest. And that doesn't just mean take a nap. Remember the Sabbath day becomes not a command to us, but an invitation from our loving God. Jesus said it this way, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'm not going to provide a queen-size comfy mattress for you. I'm going to take away the guilt of your sins. Do you truly appreciate the rest you have, that you can lay your head on the pillow at night, knowing that if you don't wake up, you'll be in heaven? Because there is no guilt on your account anymore. There is no sin staining your heart because God gives you rest through that Messiah whom he promised and sent. And on Sundays now, we come together to observe that day of rest, to thank God for the forgiveness of sins that he's given us and the peace that it brings to our souls, to joyfully live our lives in his service, using those same Ten Commandments now as a guideline to show us what's pleasing to God and how to thank him. But there's a big difference between knowing what to do and being able to do it. Adam and Eve knew they weren't supposed to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We know we're not supposed to have other gods use his name in vain. Don't forget to remember the Sabbath day, 4 through 10 as well. We know the commandments. We learned them in catechism class. We hear them in church, but to do them is entirely different. But that's where also observing the Sabbath day brings us another blessing from God. It brings us the strength we need to live our lives for him. God's commandment was to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now we might at first think, well, man, that only makes it more difficult. Remember the Sabbath day by not doing anything sinful on it. <laughs> that makes it harder than the other six days when at least our sins can be forgiven. Well, that's not what it means. Really, the word holy there is sacred. Sacred means set apart for something or someone special. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it set apart for someone special. And we know who that was. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it set apart so that you can spend time with your Heavenly Father. And that's what we do as we remember the Sabbath day on Sunday mornings. We gather together around his word and his sacraments 
so that we can grow in our strength from the gospel that is used in them. That strength enables us to obey the Ten Commandments, to say thank you to our God. It connects us to Jesus who perfectly obeyed them for us so that we can have eternal peace. It empowers us to stand up to the devil instead of being run over by him and his temptations. Remember, Jesus himself relied on the power of the gospel when he was tempted by Satan. For 40 days, he was in the wilderness being tempted, and some of the temptations of Satan sounded pretty alluring and pretty reasonable and pretty understandable. You haven't eaten any food for 40 days. There's some stones. Just turn them into bread and eat. But Jesus was there to commune with his heavenly Father, not to tend to his own needs. And instead of arguing with Satan and debating with him and trying to prove why it was better for him to do what God said than Satan, he simply said, it is written. God's word says, I should trust my heavenly father. So the devil said, all right, if, if that's what God's word says, let's, let's put that trust to the test. Let's go to the top of the, the temple and, and jump, see if he'll catch you. Because God promised he'll give his angels charge concerning you to keep you left out a key phrase, in all your ways, and the ways of a Christian should be in line with God, so when we're living in line with God, he's not going to punish us by harming us. But Jesus didn't, again, debate with Satan and argue with him and reason with him. He simply said, it's written, don't test the Lord your God. Well, then Satan questioned God's love for his son. You're here to save the world from its sins, and the way that your Heavenly Father wants you to do that is to die on a cross and suffer the pain of hell for all those people who have rejected you? I've got a better plan. See all those kingdoms out there? Just bow down and worship me, and I'll give them to you free. Boy, if you're thinking as a human being, cross versus kneeling down, it's a pretty simple choice to make. But again, Jesus didn't reason, debate, logically argue with Satan. He simply said, it is written. Worship God alone, and you're not God. It is written, it is written, it is written. That's what protected Jesus from the devil and his temptations, the power of God that comes through his word. And at the end of all those temptations, we're reminded by Matthew that the devil left him. The devil knew that he'd been beaten. The devil knew that Jesus wasn't going to give in. And when we remember the Sabbath day, we can arm ourselves with that same strength. When we gather together on a regular basis around the word and the sacraments, that power of God is given to us so that we can live in ways that are pleasing to him, so that we can honor him for what he's doing, and so that we can remember that heaven one day is ours because of him. In a few minutes, we're going to sing, God's word is our great heritage. And as you sing that this morning, I want it to be more than just the words that were written in a hymn, but it's really our response to God's command, remember the Sabbath day. God's word has been our way to remember the Sabbath day for hundreds of years. Christians have rested from their earthly labors and taken time to spend with God around his word. And it's that, that word that is to be foremost in the time that we spend with God. Our worship service has been carefully crafted over hundreds of years to center around that word. We come together covered in sin, confessing our sins and receiving the promise of forgiveness. We then hear readings from God's word and a sermon explaining one of those readings in which God's word strengthens us. We're invited to receive the very body and blood of Jesus shed and poured out for our sins so that we can be forgiven. And then we respond with prayers and songs of thanks and praise. That's how we observe the Sabbath day. Do you have to go to church? No. But the question really for us is, why wouldn't I go to church? There God comes to me through word and sacrament. There God forgives my sins and gives me strength. 
Their God keeps me safe from the devil. And then I go out for six days and tend to my earthly responsibilities as my way of showing my love for God, doing the best that I can, recognizing my failures and trusting his forgiveness, and hopefully during those six days also using God's word to draw strength and rest. And then I have an opportunity to gather together with my Christian friends again. Now the devil's going to give you all kinds of excuses. Why not? Rocky and Bullwinkle and Sherman and Peabody. Church is boring. I've heard it all before. The songs are old. It's tired. I already know what the pastor's going to say. Weather's a little bit difficult today. Bed feels nice. It was a late night. The devil's going to give you all kinds of excuses. You could give me more. He whispers them in your ears. But are you going to listen to the devil who is only out to destroy you eternally or are you going to listen to God who loved you so much that he gave his one and only son for you? These commandments do not bind and restrict us in life. They free us for life. Remember the Sabbath day is for our good so that we can have rest for our bodies, rest for our souls, strength for our bodies, strength for our souls. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it sacred, keeping it special for God. Remember what God has done for you and what he promises to do for you. And then remember, children don't always understand that. If they ask you if you have to go to church, say yes. And then make them get dressed and come with you. And as they get older, you can explain why the yes was yes. And then as they mature, both physically and spiritually, the do I have to will be when can I. We thank and praise God for giving us the opportunity to spend this special time with him for rest for our souls and strength for our hearts so that we can always live as his children now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God and the rest of God that he provides to us, which is beyond our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Our offering will now be gathered. Our friendship registers will be passed around. If you could please sign those, we would appreciate it. <laughs>